Hey everybody, welcome to uh, another edition of an online Bible study. I guess I can say that. We believe this is our seventh online video format. Sometimes we study uh, the Bible. We've studied Philippians. We've studied several books of the Bible, James. But guys, I want you to listen and hopefully you can journey with us. We as a church are going to do something that has really been several months in the making. Um, We're going to call it a a discipleship video series. I'll call this um, volume one. And really it's simple. The simple premise is this. Um, What does it look like to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Um, Our goal in this series is to break some things down just to a very foundational level so we get it, we own and understand it. Many of us that are probably watching have said this statement, hey, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Kind of now what? What do I need to think about? For many uh, of us, we don't really know some very fundamental truths that we need to know, we need to put into our lives um, to really follow Jesus Christ. Um, a lot of you might be watching and you've accepted Christ, you've, um, you've felt that void in your life and you know that, hey, you know what, there is an answer to life and it's not stuff or substances, but it is a relationship with God's own son, Jesus Christ. So we make no apologies as to um, the answer to life is found in Jesus Christ. That's what we believe as a church. And so what we want to do is we want to uh, take 14 weeks and we're going to do this um, as a volume one series and just call call it Discipleship Volume One, Becoming a Follower of Jesus Christ. I've asked Pastor Pat, my mom, um, who's journeyed with me in ministry for years and years and years, really to sit in week one because this has kind of been her um, baby for a lot of years. You have taught what we call discipleship class here through our local church. And so, Mom, I'm just give them the reasons before we get into this week's question and what we're looking at. And each week, we're going to kind of be building these foundational um, truths in our lives, so to speak, to follow Christ. Why is it so important um, that you teach this class? Why do people need to spend some time with us through this this 14-week series? Well, I have found out through the years of ministry that people have needs. They want to know that they're safe. They want to come in. They accept Christ as their Savior. And then they don't know what to do from the next step. And they don't quite understand what even coming to know Christ is all about. You explain it. That's like a child. They have to kind of grow up to learn certain things of life. But as new believers, we should know beyond a shadow of a doubt what happened to us when we came to ask I personally think that most people come to know Christ because somebody has prayed for them and that's the convicting power of Christ gets to them or they have a really major need and they they go to someone and they say I want to know Jesus as my savior they can say the sinner's prayer a million times, but unless they are convicted of their sins, believe in their heart that God is God and God can forgive them of their sins, then it's null and void because most people accept Jesus, but then they continue on the same lifestyle that they did before they ever came to know Christ. And that's kind of our goal is to answer what is next. So what, is next? what, what you're watching in this series, it, it is predominantly built, as we've done it in our church, for a what we would call a new convert. I know that sounds a little strange, but that's somebody steps. that who's accepted Christ and are like, hey, what do I need to think about? What do I need to be focusing on um, as I walk with Christ? But I found in my life, as I've actually gone back through some of the content that we're going to go over, we all need it. Whether you've walked in with Christ for a lot of years, it's easy to, I, I've equated in church lately, to get blurry vision. Mm-hmm. And we have to just go back to, hey, why is it so important that we follow Christ in some things that we really really need to think about. So this week, I want you to get something to write with, get your Bibles out. Um, there's going to be an outline on the app, on the, on the website, or you can just grab a notepad and write some things down. And remember it, these are things that you will always reference back to, especially sometimes when life gets tough, when maybe you don't see things the way you need to see things. We're going to talk about it this week, a feeling that you might have versus a fact um, of your faith. And so we're going to start week one with this statement on on this video discipleship series. People ask all the time, how do I know that I'm saved? 
Okay, so we're going to keep it simple week one. We will build as the weeks go on. But here's the question. How do I know that I'm saved? I'll put it in this context. I've had people many times come up to me. They say, Pastor, I've been a Christian for six months now. I've been a Christian for a year now. Things aren't really going well in my life. I'm not really getting that warm and gooey feeling. Um, so yeah, I'm maybe having a lot of doubts as to what's going on because you see a world of sin, death, and disease all around you. And so they ask that question straight up. Hey, how do I know? that I'm saved. So what we want to do is kind of answer that question. We're going to give you a lot of information, but mostly it's application. How do we know that we're saved? I, I think that's a great question. And so we have to refer to it. We're going to with the Bible. That's what we believe. We believe this is God's word. Um, so that's our choice. You get to make a choice, but we can understand through the power of God's word so many important things about our faith that really matters in our life. And so we, we're going to refer to the Bible. We're going to lock in on some scripture that you and I can lock in on whenever we go through those seasons of doubt, when we start to ask the question, hey, hey, how do I know that I'm saved? Because sometimes we don't feel that way. So I want to start with Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And I use this verse in church a lot, but you maybe have never heard this verse before. Here's what the Bible says. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead... The Bible says this way, you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved or you could be saved. It says you will be saved. So mom, here's the thing before we really jump into a lot of information. What does it mean to believe in your heart? Well, it's more than an intellectual thing. It's more than just saying Jesus was a great teacher or even saying that, hey, Jesus was God's son. It's to believe, and you kind of alluded to it, it's to believe believe that he is the savior of your life. He is the answer to which you are going to find life's greatest question. And it, he, you're going to allow him to trust you, to trust him with your life, to give him your heart, to give him your soul. You're willing to follow him the rest of your life. That word believe is an all encompassing word. We tend to believe in everything, but that word believe is so powerful here it is. to believe it because you talk about lifestyle. You know what? I, I kind of always compared it to a marriage. When you really commit to a person for the rest of your life, you trust in that person with your life. You trust that person with your life. And you give that marriage your heart and your soul, and you're willing to follow that spouse the rest of your life. Everybody goes to the altar with those in mind. Some carry it through, some don't. But that's the intent when you get married. When, when you give your heart and life to Jesus, you've got to trust him with your life. You've got to give him your heart and soul, but you've got to be willing to follow him. And that's to give up a lot of things that a lot of people are so tied to today. But if they would really look look at it the way life really is. I look at my life, and I got saved when I was 12, but I really came to have a great relationship with God when I was 36 because that's when I really realized exactly what it was all about. And, I mean, I just feel like I gave everything to him then. But I didn't understand exactly all of it, but I did know that Jesus Christ came in my heart and life. And so I started following, doing the things that I felt God wanted me to do with my life, like reading the Bible, coming to church, telling others about Jesus. There's just a lot of Christ-like things that we do. People who say you're Christian, I got saved, so I'm a Christian, but they're not following what God tells them to do. And that's the essential. That's what causes you to grow, to listen to your pastor. Listen to what that message said. Apply that to your heart and life. Make sure that nothing derails you from reading the Bible every day, from praying to him and talking to him every day, being in a commitment for church, not just hit and miss all the time. It's a disciplined life. The Christ-like life is a disciplined life, but you enjoy it because you have a relationship that you started by faith, and the, the longer it goes, the more you think, hey, God is real. He's really my life. Do I feel like God is really in my life every single day? Of course not. 
but I know he's there even because it is a fact I gave him my life and I'm following him and one of these days I, I do feel it again well it says to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that is a confession of telling other people that hey I, I follow Christ just saying, hey, I'm a Christian, doesn't mean you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. But when you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the answer to your life, you are willing to trust him with your life, and you're willing to go out and not be apologetic and say, you know what? As for, I don't know about your choice, but as for me, and I surely hope you would follow as well, as for me, I follow Jesus Christ because he is the answer to my life. I was save, saved um, at 15 years old, and I had a lot of doubt, a lot of fear. Um, but when I was saved, um, the school that I went to, people knew that I was a Christian. I told them that. I confessed that. Before that, I was a churchgoer. I was a preacher's kid. I would say everything, but, hey, I follow Jesus Christ. Christ. And they um, began to know and understand that, hey, um, he's a guy that's not going to get it right all the time, but he's following Christ. And uh, for me, it, it made my faith come alive because I knew that to be true. I knew that you ask me how I know Jesus Christ lives. He lives in my life. And so it starts with that. It starts with that Romans 10, 9. Now, when we come to salvation, it's not something that we can do on our own. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, It is by grace that you have been saved. I have been saved through faith. It's by grace. We can't earn salvation. Um, that's not what grace means. It's God's unmerited favor, a gift that we don't deserve. It's not for sale. It's a gift he wants to give you. And it's a gift that you can accept through faith and faith alone. It's not a feeling, it's, a, it's faith that the fact that Jesus Christ died for me, that he came to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave, to give me eternal life, to give me eternal hope, and that's what I'm going to believe in and trust in and walk in. So how do you know you're saved? It starts with Romans 10, 9. I want you to think about that verse of Scripture. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Now if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture, and we're going to unpack this. The assurance of salvation comes because we have Jesus Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's what we're going to kind of be redundant week one. How do we know we're saved? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, it's really very clear in the Bible. Verse 11 says this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son, that's Jesus Christ, has Life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know that you are saved, that you may know that you have received a gift that you don't deserve. So we kind of broke it down pretty simple in, in an outline simple. and just some things to write down and to think about. To from, always go to. From those verses, who gives eternal life? God gives right eternal there. life. It says right there. Go to your Bibles. Look at it. Where is eternal life found? It is in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, Christ alone. alone. It's not works. It's not what we do. It's not being a good person. It's not just believing in certain certain principles and religious. It's, it's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And who has eternal life? They can find it right there in that verse. Who has it? Those who believe in God. Has the, the Son, son. living in, with him. Uh, Brent, I think the best thing about Pastor Brown, I think all this comes to the point where the assurance of salvation is not based on feelings. Because if that was the case, none of us would feel like it all the time. And most people come to know Christ when they're in a major need. They accept Christ then. And a lot of times they're not out of that problem as, except for the fact they have Christ in their life. Some are depressed, some are sick, some are down. There's all kinds of reasons. But it doesn't matter at that point. Tell us about the three main words, the three F words, actually. <laughs> three F words. Can you that believe your mother well. would say that? <laughs> well, I mean, we look at it, um, finding Jesus Christ, owning and understanding the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth 
to really love us, to die for us, to, to rise again for our, our sin, to take the keys of death, hell, and the grave away, and to give us eternal hope. So there's fact, there's faith, and there's feelings. And really, in that order, as a Christian, it's essential that we own and understand as we walk through our everyday life those, those three words in that order. You can't just go, well, today I feel like I'm on top of the world, so God must love me. Or today I feel like, man, maybe I did something that I shouldn't have done. God hates me. I mean, it starts with the fact of that God would send his only son. It's not just some spiritual truth. That's historical fact that Jesus Christ would walk the earth. He would die for you. He would die for me. We choose, you get to make that choice to put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Everybody, don't ever believe the lie that people aren't looking for answers. Okay, Everyone's looking for an answer. In some way, shape, or form, we believe, I believe with all of my being that Jesus Christ is the answer to my life, that he is the Son of God. I have a gift. I have a relationship with him that I don't deserve. Um, I know that that carries me. My faith is not easily shattered the longer that I walk with Christ. But there are days when I feel like, man, what is going on? Why is the world the way it is? When I watch the news, I see what's going on and people that I love and know. It's easy to uh, have this feeling of like, man, I don't know. And so a lot of people, just like we started, come up to you and say, man, how do I know that I'm saying? I don't even know that I feel that way. Don't ever believe the feeling. Start with the fact and build your faith on the fact. Brent, I, I love this idea uh, like a train. It's the engine that is the fact. God in his word said it, so therefore I am. The, the middle car is faith or our trust in Christ. The engine can go on. That is fact without us even having the faith. But God still forgives whether we believe it or not. But the last part, the, the caboose is the our feelings. Caboose, there you go. Well, they ain't a train. Right. That's what you call it. But that, an engine can go right on with that, that little caboose on the rear end. And that's what our emotions are. It still goes back. If we're on a train of life... That we, if we believe that God is God and he can forgive us of our sins, it doesn't matter even whether we do believe it. It is a fact that it is true. He can do that if we will accept the fact by faith that he has forgiven us. Just think about it this way. Um, in your own <clears throat> life right now, when do you feel like doubting your, your faith or your salvation? Things go wrong, sickness, you see the world through really a, just a corrupt lens. There's a lot of darkness out there. There's a lot of, of turmoil. Um, and so it's, it's easy to just, well, you know what, everything's based off feelings. That's kind of our society. But there's a fact there. There's a truth there. There's an absolute truth there. We always say, you know, like gravity is a fact. You might feel like you can fly. We'll go to the ch top of the church and jump off and see, see if that far. feeling, how far that feeling gets you. There is a fact. Remember that, that promise that you can rest on. That's why that um, faith is so important that you can trust in Christ. Um, our emotions fluctuate, but God stays the same. And that's so important um, when you walk into Christ to say, wait a minute, I've accepted Christ. Um, I'm putting my faith and trust in him. All my chips are in. I'm walking in him. I'm telling people that he is the answer to my life. And there might be days you might not feel like it, but that's okay. I mean, continue to walk in that trust. Um, it's, it's not that breakable. And so that's really, really important. Um, God was the same yesterday, today, and he will forever be. Whether I believe it or not. He, it, that is a fact. That will happen. And can he forgive us and save us? Absolutely, without one doubt. I like this, and I'll just read it because I think this is good. Um, I think feel, the word feel or feeling, is probably one of the most dangerous words in Christianity. Our feelings can be affected by circumstance, our health, by the humidity outside, by how much sunlight we get or don't get. A lot of things affect your feelings that have nothing to do with whether or not that you have put your trust and faith in Christ and the fact remains that you are saved and your eternal destination has changed and you have a hope that cannot be taken away. And so remember that. I mean, a lot of people doubt, you know, they, they am, I, am I actually a Christian? I think there's a lot of people today because maybe the choices that we made, the stuff we've gone through, how could God possibly love me? God loves you so much that he would send Christ to die for you. And that fact, like Mother said, is the engine that will 
will continue on and continue on. And we can jump on that and we can move through life. We can understand or we can get stuck. We can be back in the caboose that's cut loose and sits there and life can be our emotions. stuck. I mean, we can, you, you, you know that. We innately understand how we can get stuck let and we can tell, get down. Let me say this. What should people do when they are doubting? Let, let me give you a, a good scenario on that. I was teaching uh, this class and I had a young mother, had an eight-year-old child, and she called me one morning. And she says, Pat, he does, God doesn't love me anymore. He hates me. I've done wrong. I said, what did you do? She said, Nicole couldn't get her clothes on this morning. She didn't want to wear what I wanted to wear. And I screamed at her, and then I screamed at my husband. And I said, well, what did you do then? And she said, I fell down on my knees, and I said, God, don't ever let me do that again. And I said, you did exactly what you should have done, because if you do that two or three times, you will learn exactly what not to do to begin with. And I'm not saying it's not bad to scream at your kids, but it is. It, apparently, she went over the top. But she learned real fast that she said, all I need to do, God, don't ever, ever, ever let me get myself in that shape again. And I do that. Even today, I say, God, if my attitude is not what it ought to be, if I'm negative or whatever, I don't want to be that kind of a person. And if you do, if you are, then just start right there and say, God, help me not to entrust me. You, do, you keep doing that and you, the conviction power of God tells you you are not acting right, then he will totally take that away and you can just continue on with life and know that you are following God and doing what God wants you to do. So you can always know that you are saved if you're following God. That's the big if. Well, I ask people a lot, especially in, in a marriage counseling setting, what do you want in your life? And all, always they're going to say, we want to be happy. Sure. And Everybody I'm like, listen, does. you don't want happiness. That's not what you're at. That's not what we're really wanting in life. Happiness depends on outward circumstances. You want joy. You, you want joy, which goes with peace, peace, which goes with unconditional love, which goes with, I want to go to my home and not have to walk on eggshells. And I want somebody to love me unconditionally. And that's what you want. And I tell them that you can find joy. The Bible says really salvation makes joy complete in our lives, but you have to start with living and trusting in Christ. God does not want you happy. He does not want me happy as much as he wants me holy because once we become walking down that holiness road, then joy starts to build in our life and it transcends circumstances that, you know what, when we go through ebbs and flows, which we are, peaks and valleys in life, there is still the fact that is an anchor for our soul. That is, Jesus Christ loves me so much that he gave his only life for me, so much that he rose again, that he conquered the keys of death, hell, and the grave, that I don't have to be afraid of not only life after, but each and every day, afraid of the darkness, afraid of the unknown. And you know, a lot of, there are consequences. We talked about that to doubt. You know, we, we don't have joy. Um, we're hindered in maybe ministry. People want their lives to be significant. They, they want to do something with their life. And if we doubt our salvation, that we um, don't have anything to offer, um, but God loves us so much that we have something to offer in him, we can not We can be even affected in ministry. I'm not talking church. People think church ministry. No. That's ministry in your home, to your wife, to your kids, to your husband, to your, your community, wherever you work. Um, we can easily fall into sin, I think, um, when we start to doubt. That's where people, I think, that's the enemy. And I mean, we'll get into, there is an enemy that is, you look around, it doesn't take any effort to see that there is an evil in our world. And there's an enemy that would say this, you're not saved. What, what is all that? That's probably that, that fact they talk about. That's maybe, that's their choice, but it's really a figment of your imagination. So go chase the stuff that's going to fill you in your life. See how that works out for person after person when we get so easily trapped into sin. We can say we trust Christ, but if we run every single day and trust everything else but Christ then we're living on a feeling. We're living on, hey, doubts, because that's when we have to try to chase things that we try to fill in, in our lives. Um, we put God first, despite how we feel. We know that God will be there throughout everything. We continually just put God first. It changes um, our attitudes. It changes our actions. And I know that to be true because I've lived that out. When you put God first 
and you say, I'm going to trust in you, no matter what you walk on, you might be tempted to say, hey, I doubt and I want to walk this direction. But then you go, man, the people that I've noticed that walk these other directions are nowhere in life. They are struggling to find any answer to their life. They get so easily trapped into so many things. And the last thing that they have is joy, any type of joy, any type of security in their life. And last time I checked, you know what? I am not a religious person trying to do religious things so I can be good enough to find these things. This is a gift. I know I'm saved because of a gift God has given me in Christ. Why would I ever want to abuse that gift and trust in anything else? You know, Pastor Brent, you have just started this new series on focus, and you brought up Remember to Remember. That's how I live by faith. I I look back in my life and think, I remember times when I thought, there is no way that I can get through this. But then when I do, I think, hey, Satan had better never ever tell me that I don't love God and I am not forgiven and my sins are under the blood because by going and looking back, I can see so much clearer than I can to take the next next step forward and on and on and on because you know, you understand how he has helped you through all that. So he, I think, well, if he did that for me, he can do this little thing. It won't be any problem at all. And that assures me that God is with me and I am saved because he is walking with me every day. And we all should... Remember and know that God is God and God can do anything, whether it's big or little. But we have to trust him, believe in it, and know that God is God. So you said the word believe, and we'll close this week with this. If you have your Bibles, John three sixteen, you probably know. Acts chapter 16, verse 31, and Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Okay, what do all three of these verses, what is in common with these three verses? I'm going to read them all, and I want you to kind of pick the word out real quick. You know, what are these promises? Promises from God's word have in common. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, we just read it while ago, Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That that word belief is more than just an intellectual word. It's an all-encompassing word. It's to put your faith and to put your trust in Jesus Christ, period. No matter what, to anchor that down in your life and say, this is what I will stand on, rest on, run to, surrender to all of my days. That word believe. How do you know that you're saved? You can believe that Jesus Christ died for you, that loves you so much that he took away your sin, that you now have hope, you you now have um, a cleansing from maybe some of the dirtiest things that you've ever done. You're like, how can I ever be clean again? Jesus Christ has wiped your sin away because of his grace. You can believe that. No matter what anyone tells you, how they look down on you, or the enemy tries to beat you down and say, you know what, there's no way you're good enough to have a relationship with Jesus. I will agree with that. There's no way we're good enough, but Jesus Christ loved us so much. Why would we not not believe in that, live in that, trust in that. To me, that's where it all starts. How awesome is that, that that's where it starts? It's something that we don't deserve, but God has given us that. Why would we abuse that and walk in any way but that? Well said. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to start this discipleship series. Um, thank you for just uh, loving us. God, as we look to you, um, give us confidence in, in, in this, in, even in this video segment, that when we have doubts, we don't have to doubt. We don't have to have a, a relationship based on feeling. Feelings are there. Emotions are there. When we look to your goodness and grace, I get emotional all the time thinking how much you love me despite what I've done in my life and my doubts and my disbeliefs. But God, I am so grateful for the fact 
that I know that Jesus Christ died for me because he loves me, that all my chips are in. That's my, um, that is my statement in life. That is what I'm going to believe, to trust in. Will I get it right every single day? Will, my, will I take my eyes off Christ sometimes? Sure, I will. But I'm so thankful for that fact that I can base my faith on. And that's when I can feel like, you know what, God, wow, I can't believe you love me as much as you do. Why would I ever run to anything else? Thank you for the gift of salvation in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.